So we carry on with our explanation for chapter, uh, chapter uh, three, four, uh, intro, uh, railway systems engineering, understanding this discipline, systems engineering, and we have reached section two. And in section two, we'll be looking at some of the fundamental topics that affect system engineering. So that, without further ado, let's start looking at systems engineering in railways so this is the uh, this is the chapter uh, content and we will be let, let me start from the beginning of the chapter we will be discussing the following topics we will be talking about the v diagram and how important is the v diagram for uh, systems design also, we'll talk about requirements. What is a requirement and how we collect requirements from different stakeholders to build our system. Also, we'll talk about some concepts in systems engineering, specifically the things that are related to reliability. Also, we'll talk about system design and functional decomposition. This concept of uh, uh, decompose, decomposing functions from requirements. Also, we'll talk about some of the systems engineering tools that are available and people use. Then we will be talking about configuration management. So this is the V diagram, the whole grail of systems engineering, one of the most important graphs. And it tells the story of how we, we really build systems. So we start with a concept of operation or a systems engineering plan. Then we need to start writing requirements. What do we expect our system to achieve? If we are building a car, we expect the car speed to be 200 kilometers per hour or to reach the 200 kilometers per hour. We expect it to accelerate at 1.2 meter per sec. We ex expect it to be comfy. We expect, expect it to have enough capacity for eight, uh, eight passengers. So you start writing the requirements of the systems that you are trying to build. And if it's a complex railway project, it will take much more time. So, the second thing, we'll talk about subsystem requirements, high level design. And by that, it's uh, now we have system level requirements, then we look at the subsystem. But what's important that we will reach the functional decomposition. Now, we know that we have a requirement that the, dry, uh, that the car should have a speed of 100 miles per hour. So we say this is a drive. So we get the function drive out of the, from the requirement. We decompose functions. We decompose these functions to try to think what physical components, what kind of systems can satisfy those uh, physical components. So we say, actually, we need a motor to drive. And then we start uh, uh, doing verification and validation. And verification is, is for the functions. So we'll be saying, does the motor achieve the function drive? and we say, yes, it actually do. Then we look at does, uh, when we want to validate the original requirements that we started, does the motor validate the requirement uh, uh, maximum speed should be 200 kilometers per hour? And we say, yes, it's actually validate that. So now we have a clear V diagram. We have a clear understanding of how we can uh, uh, decide, build railway requirements until we we build them to, at the top until we validate those requirements. So now how we can capture those requirements, how we can understand those requirements. To understand these requirements, you need to understand different stakeholders. You need, for example, this computer, many people use it. Many people are affected by it. There are external users, executive users, middle manager users, technical staff, clients, information users, and business users, and all has its own requirements. So those requirements should be, should be collecting the viewpoints of different stakeholders that will be using the system. And in the case of railways, this is passengers, maintainers, designers, contractors, uh, operators, uh, uh, students, uh, emplo uh, employees, employers, freight, uh, freight rail services, and others. So we need to collect all of these stakeholders and to collect their viewpoints and their requirements in a written and clarified manner, and a clear uh, and a clear manner. And what do we mean by 
written in a clear manner that it should be measurable. The requirement should be measurable, achievable, and sometimes testable. So it should be measurable. We need to write a, a statement that we can measure. We need to write a statement that we can achieve. And we need to, to write a statement that we can test in many cases. And many projects fail because of the incomplete requirements or issue related to requirements. So we, we don't really what we are building clearly. So, and this affects how we build. So capturing requirements depends on capturing viewpoints of different stakeholders. So you need to catch these few points of different stakeholders. Requirements can be design requirements, systems level requirements, user requirements, operational requirements, maintenance requirements, and reliability requirements. There are, so this is just an example. So it can be, a, this is a design requirement. This is a maintenance requirement. This is an operational requirement based on different stakeholder viewpoint. And sometimes we split, split those to man, man, uh, mandatory requirements and preferential requirements. One of the tools that col can collect those requirements, it is a software called Doors that was bought by, by IBM. So when you are talking about, uh, for example, a big, uh, railway project system, like a, a high-speed rail line that is connecting two cities, you might really have hundreds of thousands of requirements. Requirements for the train control system, requirements for the vehicle, requirements for the infrastructure, requirements for uh, signs, requirement for, um, for, uh, for uh, doors in stations, requirements for ticket barriers. So you would have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and maybe hundreds of thousands of these requirements. To collect them, you would need that software to help you to trace them as well. Now, I just want to stop a little bit on performance requirements. So some systems you would face hard time measuring. So a failure is the same as fault. A, a failure-free operating period is the period that does not have that failure. And to, in order to measure the reliability of our system, we measure things like mean time between failures. So for example, Today we had a failure and tomorrow we had a failure and the day after that we had a failure. So we have a mean time between failures a day, 24 hours. Every 24 hours there is a failure. But also you have mean time between maintenance. So first failure did not require maintenance. Second failure did not require maintenance. Uh, uh, sorry, in the second failure we have applied maintenance. Third failure did not require maintenance. On the first uh, failure, we required maintenance. So this means mean time between maintenance. Then we look at mean downtime, which is the uh, how long the system was uh, down. So the, the system yesterday was down for one minute. The system tomorrow was down uh, will be down for two minutes, and the system today will be down for three minutes. So the average minimum downtime is two minutes for those three days. So this helps you to understand reliability, but also you can understand availability. And you say, what, how available is this railway line? How, or how much available is, is this railway system? And you look at me, and let me read those in uh, quickly, those uh, acronyms. So mean time between failures equal mean time between failures plus mean time to repair the time between mean time between failures plus the mean time to repair those failures. This is inherent availability. Achieved av availability, mean time between maintenance divided by mean time between maintenance plus maintenance. And operational availability, mean time between maintenance uh, divided by mean time between maintenance plus mean down time. Now let's talk about functional decomposition. There are types of models. There are physical models, analog models, mathematical models, and schematic models. We will be working with schematic models to decompose systems functions. So we look at drive car. So this simple function of drive car, we need to do a schematic model for this function. So this, this function is a high level function that have six functions. Start car, accelerate car, turn car, decelerate car, stop car. And this function actually can be achieved with four functions, place gear shift in park, turn on ignition, select drive, select reverse. So now you have an understanding of how we can decompose function and how we can map them. 
This is an example of a schem schematic model. Sometimes we do mathematical model. We represent these with mathematical symbols and we try to do calculations. Sometimes we use physical models like in case of fluids. And sometimes we use analog models like digital models. For the mapping, this is schematic models. Now they are becoming very standardized and there are many standards for functional flow block diagrams. So one is IDEF0. DFDs and UMLs, and those are standards. And if you want to build a large system, it would be right for you to, to choose one of those standards. And you need to follow the instruction of these systems. Now let us look at tools. So now I understand what's a requirement and I understand what's a function, and I need to see how we can collect these requirements in one place and how we can uh, understand our system performance and other aspects. So there are many softwares that can help you and you can divide them into systems engineering, environments tools, analysis, to, analysis tools, reliability assessment tools, and decision support tools. And some of the examples are software called Cradle, Doors, Core. What is good in these systems is that it helps you in traceability. And traceability is understanding that this component is actually attached to requirement number 1.23 dot 568 and that requirement was in the standard uh, 50 12060 and it's about safety and assurance of uh, of railway vehicles so so if you think about how a requirement how this physical component satisfy this requirement and you and you can trace those requirements uh, from different systems you would have a better understanding of your system but also there are other tools that you can apply, which is are like formal or face-to-face -face tools, like checks and measures. You would do a technical review on different systems. You would do something like a baseline, understanding that this is our baseline, this is our second baseline. baseline. And you would do something like configuration management. And configuration management is a very wide topic, which is about understanding that the changes that you have introduced to your requirements and their impact, their impact on your overall system or the changes that happen to requirements and their impact on the cost or impacts on different aspects of other requirements. So configuration management is about making change and understanding, uh, understanding the impact of that change and controlling the change. So let's look at config, uh, for config, uh, configuration management. So control, control changes to the configuration or design. For example, many cases you would have a design change. change. This is really, one of the uh, one of the basic things that can happen in any project design changes so you would be managing requirements interfaces function performance cost safety project technical risk so that design change for example one of the changes how did it affect our original project requirements how do, did it affect our interfaces how it affect our systems functions how it affects the system performance how it affects the cost, pro the uh, project costs. How it does it affect safety, project, and technical risk? Configuration management planning starts with configuration identification, configuration control, configuration status accounting, and configuration verification and audit. This is just how you identify the change, you, you control the change, you record that what kind of uh, accounting things will happen to the change, and you verify it. So performance measurements, hazards and incident analysis, access and backup storage, version control, resource management, changes approval process, impact analysis, roles and responsibilities. This is just some of the examples. We have reached the end of section uh, uh, two. I hope you like that section. We'll continue with you in the coming uh, lesson on a new topic on systems engineering. And this will be a very rich chapter on understanding the science and the discipline of system engineering. Have a great evening and we'll see you in the next lesson.